And joining us today for the pundits, we have Kevin Richard of Idaho Education News and, as always, Dr. Jim Weatherby and Betsy Russell of The Spokesman Review. So we just talked to Secretary of State Denny about campaign finance law. And you advocate for open government and transparency. From where you're sitting, how is the state of Idaho's campaign finance law? Well, clearly there are things that, that should be tightened up. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I talk to other people who read campaign finance reports, there's kind of a subculture out there of <laughs> political junkies and, and reporters and people who are interested in read campaign finance reports. And they can tell you a lot of interesting things, but there is also a lot that they do not tell you. And particularly when we get into companies and the idea of related companies and shell corporations and what are all these entities, sometimes you can trace down the money only so far and you just come to a brick wall and it's the name of a company. And it does seem like we should be able to look behind that brick wall if we really want to know who's behind these campaigns. Where's the money coming from? Mm, Kevin, you go through campaign finance documents for your reporting. Uh, how is it from your point of view, and how's the technology? Is it keeping up with the, the demand and the interest? I think the technology is catching up, but you find kind of black holes in the campaign finance uh, arena all over the place. And I think they're probably more prevalent uh, when you get to school elections. Uh, until you know, in, until this year or until the next round of school board elections next year, you have no way of knowing who is giving to trustee candidates. You also have no way of knowing who is giving to uh, supplemental levy campaigns or bond issue campaigns or recall election campaigns. And that was a big issue in the whole West Ada recall process. Nobody could tell you who's giving money on either side of the recall election. Nobody could tell you who gave to the trustee candidates in 2015. It was a colossal black hole. It was a source of frustration for me as a reporter to not be able to answer basic questions about who's supporting who or who's supporting what in, in the state's largest school district. And, there, and another issue that comes up in every primary election is that there simply aren't any reports required until just seven days before the primary right. election. And this is an issue that Lawrence Denny actually raised during his campaign for Idaho Secretary of State and that he said he wants to fix. And I hear that he is going to be looking at that this summer, and we may finally see some changes proposed next year, but it was it was particularly problematic, I thought, this year. In this year's primary election, um, after I started doing reports on campaign finance, I had people contact me and say, why are you waiting till right before the election to bring out all this negative stuff? And I said, you know, these there were no reports <laughs> until now. We don't get them until one week before. If we had them two or three weeks before, the voters might have a lot more information. I mean, Jim, we talk about colossal black holes and issues with the timeline for reporting, but why does it matter? Well, I think it matters to the public who want to know where, where this money is coming from and get some notion of who's on which side. Uh, the um, recall election in West Ada County, there were a lot of rumors about how those sides were lining up and the, the what some money of, rumor that the said. black money rumor. Mm -hmm. We had no uh, source of information there, and as Betsy pointed out in terms of the primary, the information comes out so late, it's after probably a lot of people have already voted when they're, With the when they're voting voters. absentee sure. ballot. Uh, so there needs to be some adjustment to that deadline, very definitely. But can you think of any instance in which the funding source of a campaign actually changed the outcome of an election, that voters cared enough that it changed how they voted? Oh, I, I can't uh, name one funding source, but I just think it's important for the public to know who is, who is the source of this funding and maybe being able to understand what the motivations of that funding is, particularly I, when it's, we're looking at fairly large amounts of money in this last primary campaign. I can think of an example. I, I can't necessarily say that it changed the vote, but it was a pretty notorious case. Education Voters of Idaho raised a ton of money. It was presented as a group of Idaho parents who did not want to repeal the Luna laws, and it went to court. They were forced to reveal their sources of money, and in fact, they were mostly wealthy individuals from out of state. They were not a, a group of Idaho parents, and those measures did pass. And changing topics just a little bit, um, we, you've been covering the issue of transgender bathrooms and the state's involvement or, or sort of involvement right. in a court case against the federal government. Walk us through what the issue is and what Idaho did. Okay, so on May 13th, the Obama administration issued guidelines. Uh, they called it guidance. It's not binding uh, legislation or anything like that regarding uh, 
uh, accommodations for transgender students. The, the reaction from a lot of Republicans across the country was swift and it was uh, fairly fierce. So this week, the state of Texas uh, announced that it will file a lawsuit trying to block these guidelines. Uh, 11 states are a part of that lawsuit. Idaho is not yet, but uh, Governor Otter's office says that uh, they are going to file a friend of the court brief or an amicus brief uh, in support of the Texas lawsuit. So this is a little bit different than actually signing on as a party to the lawsuit. A an amicus brief is, is less extensive, and, and presumably it will turn out to be less ex expensive than being a party to, to a lawsuit. What's interesting is that all of this is going to be done under the governor's office, not through the attorney general's office. So it's another example of the governor uh, seeking out his own legal counsel and going his own legal route as opposed to uh, working with the AG's office. Is there any indication of whether or not the governor specifically sought out his own legal counsel or the attorney general declined to represent or, or do this amicus brief? I, I don't know if, uh, if there was a case where the governor's office went to the AG's office on this. Uh, Kevin, you talk about guidelines. Some of the reporting when this was issued talked about the possibility of this becoming a mandate or the federal government withdrawing federal monies if school districts didn't comply. Yeah, the Why idea. that uh, confusion over the... Well, the, uh, the wording that came from the, uh, the administration did talk about federal funding, specifically Title IX funding. So the idea of this being guidance or guidelines is kind of in the eye of the beholder when you start talking about federal funding. Uh, it, it becomes viewed in some circles as less, uh, as less advice and guidance and more, uh, more coercive. And now, when it comes to filing a lawsuit, being a party of the lawsuit, those things do make a difference. I mean, if all this are, is is guidelines and they're and they're not uh, mandatory, then where's the damage? What do you sue over? And so, all of those technicalities could affect the viability of any kind of legal challenge to this. Well, and, and you mentioned guidelines, and and I've I've heard people saying that this is f an example, another example of federal overreach and trampling over local control. But these aren't different than guidelines that Idaho already had. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, basically, a year ago, the Idaho School Boards Association issued its own set of guidelines on what school districts might want to do to accommodate transgender students. And these really were guidelines. I mean, the School Boards Association works with school boards; they work with trustees. Uh, this was optional language the districts could adopt. And we don't really know how many districts have adopted them, but we know that uh, the Twin Falls District was fairly early on as an adopter. Uh, the Teton County District adopted it. Uh, Blaine County is going to be discussing and perhaps voting on very similar guidelines in June. The language between the ISBA guidelines and the guidelines that came from the administration as far as uh, bathrooms and bathroom access, virtually identical. Clause by clause, they're talking about the exact same safeguards, the exact same language. They're, they're virtually identical. And how much of an issue has this been statewide since the ISBA put out these guidelines? The story I published earlier this week talking to uh, districts around the state, a handful of districts around the state, this has not been that big a deal. Uh, as I mentioned, the Twin Falls District adopted the ISBA guidelines in October. We're talking about maybe a couple of students in a district of 9,000 students. Uh, what they've done and what other districts have done is they've figured out ways to accommodate uh, students by allowing them to use uh, private, uh, private restrooms, either faculty restrooms or restrooms in, in the counselor's office. It's not been a big issue in Twin Falls and a lot of districts. It's been fairly uh, low key. It's been something that's been handled without a lot of fuss, without a lot of fanfare. What this really is right now is a new political issue that in many ways is unrelated to to the, the students in question or their, their well-being or what's even going on in our schools. We've had protesters outside Target in Coeur d'Alene because of this. That has nothing to do with the schools or their policy. This is this is a matter of national politics and rhetoric. Well, so so is is that discussion in national politics and rhetoric going to overtake some of the more nuanced conversations about this and other education-related issues uh, and social issues in the summer election cycle? You know, this is a political year, and, and in some ways everything is becoming political, and this is probably an example of it. Well, and it will be interesting to see what some of these districts do on the ground with this is issue. I, I mentioned Blaine County is going to vote on guidelines perhaps in June. The West Ada District is looking at reviewing their guidelines, their policies in place. Uh, they think that they're in compliance with the federal guidelines. They, they think they're on solid ground, but they're going to do a review. So I think 
you, you just kind of watch what happens at the district level. You watch what happens at the local level because that's really where the, the rubber meets the road here. And this is really where it's going to affect students and families that are going through a very difficult uh, life process. You know, and in this political climate that we're talking about, the legislature has plenty of interim committees and working groups over the summer and fall uh, that they need to focus on. Um, real quick, before we get into the specific, specifics of that, how much is that uh, election year excitement going to affect some of these really intricate committee discussions, Jim? Well. I think it could affect uh, some of the discussions, particularly on committees uh, dealing with uh, tax policy as well as the Medicaid gap issue. As you rightfully point out, some of these will take place in, in uh, formal interim committees, others more informal working groups. And one of the big targets, whether it will generate a lot of heat right out of the chute is the um, effort that will go forward on trying to rewrite the education foundation formula, which is a big deal, is going to take a couple of years to accomplish. Now I know with the school funding formula, Kevin, I, I've asked multiple people to explain this to me and I think the answer every single time is it will take a couple hours to really adequately explain it. Is, is, that, is that a proper characterization of how complicated this is? Assuming that we don't have a couple of hours right now. We don't now. have a couple oh, okay. hours right now, but. <laughs> now we're assuming you could explain that in, in a couple 30 hours, seconds. Kevin? If you gave me a couple <laughs> hours, I'd have a better <laughs> chance. But no, it's a very complicated formula, and it's complicated because of what has happened in the school system since 1994. We didn't have charter schools in 1994. We didn't have online schools in 1994. Technology in the schools is not nearly as, as prevalent as it is right now. Those are real changes that have been kind of been shoehorned into the budget and shoehorned into this funding formula ever since. So it's a very complicated process. And it's complicated no matter how you slice it because what you're doing with a finite amount of dollars is it's a redistribution. So some districts may come out ahead, some districts may come out behind. Now when they did the formula, redid the formula in 1994, it coincided with a huge increase in school funding. I did the math to do a similar increase per pupil in today's dollars would cost you $300 million. The state does not have another $300 million just sitting around waiting to be spent on public education. I don't know if they will be able to put how much money into the system if they try to augment it. The, the, the bottom line is, without a big infusion of money, the odds increase that some districts are going to come out behind, some districts are going to come out ahead, and that's where the fighting will really begin. And this discussion is also going on in a climate of people still talking about uh, potential tax cuts. And so, uh, Jim, can you talk a little bit about that push-pull when we're talking about a huge amount of money, potentially, but also other people who have their eyes on that money? P absolutely. Uh, legislators who are very frustrated, who run on an anti-tax uh, pledge, uh, will they uh, go with another session, a third session, without a tax cut. Now, I'm interested in the language that describes this, and it's not if, but how we're going to cut taxes. The uh, committee apparently will look at ways in which the individual and corporate income taxes can be cut. This will be taking place in the environment where there, as Kevin indicated, there's going to be pressure for more funding for education. And uh, Senator Jeff Sidaway will remain as chair, I'm sure, of Senate Local Government and Taxation Committee. And we're well aware of his position in terms of no tax cuts until you're taken care of, of teachers and the proper funding for, for education. So some of the same themes, I think, will play out. It will be interesting to see if this committee comes up with the same realities that the tax working group did last year from Jeff Sayer from the Department of Commerce saying that tax cutting is not necessarily the most economic development strategy right now. It's investing in talent and we need a more skilled workforce to provide opportunities for economic advancement. I think there has been some effort on the part of leadership to try to define a more narrow role for this coming tax <laughs> study group because the last one it was quite broad and they looked at what's going on with our taxes, what's right and wrong with them, 
And there was a, a big hope that, that the outcome of that would be a proposal to cut income tax rates, particularly for the wealthy. Well, that turned out not to be what came out on top. When they did all the research, they found out actually many parts of our tax system are fair. In fact, our tax burden overall is quite low compared to not only the surrounding states, but to all states. And so I think that there will be an effort to push this committee more towards how will you <laughs> come up with a way to cut taxes this time? But again, that's got to be balanced against these other needs. Well, and, and speaking of other needs and other interim committees and working groups, we also have the issue of what to do with the indigent population and health care needs, the, the gap population. Mm -hmm. And so will these committees be looking at everything holistically and how everything is sort of a push-pull, or are they going to be attacking it one by one by one? Well, I think by their nature, it's one by one. We have these little silos, so there will be a group looking at how can we structure an Idaho solution to the 78,000 people in Idaho who don't have health insurance, who fall into that gap, can't qualify for anything because they make too much or too little or both. Um, and at the same time, someone else is going to be talking about spending that same money on tax cuts. And it's only when the whole legislature comes together that, that they can make those calls and set those priorities. And you would think that the way the Medicaid issue unfolded at the end of the session, the way it came down to the final hours of the session with no action, you would think that going into 2017, barring a, a seismic shift in the way the legislature is composed, that that goes to the head of the line just by virtue of the fact that it was left unresolved. One comment about last year's uh, interim groups and the fact that interim committees and the fact that I think a majority of them actually worked through a portion of the next legislative session. In fact, the Urban Renewal Committee, I think, worked through almost the entire legislative session. It will be interesting to see if that's a precedent uh, for these groups. The uh, appointment of committee members is what, June 17th? June 17th, so when the Legislative Council meets. They're really kind of behind the eight ball already in terms of moving forward on, and really working on some very major issues and this for year, 2017. There, there may be even more incentive for them to go beyond the start of the legislative session because perhaps the political year and the elections that are going on will keep them from considering anything terribly controversial until after November. So you have all these different groups looking at everything individually, and all of them are scrambling for a huge amount of money, or potentially a huge amount of money. Which issue is yelling the loudest? Mm -hmm. eh? No? <laughs> Medicaid? I, I, again, I think cool. I would start with Medicaid simply because that's where we left off. But, you know, school funding, I mean, it's still 48% of the budget, K-12 spending. And you'll still have higher ed in this equation because uh, the scholarship issues were largely left unaddressed, unresolved, so yeah, it's going to be a long line. A, a lot of noise can be made over a lot of issues. There's a great deal of concern about those in the Medicaid gap. There seems to be uh, growing support for doing something, but it's a question of who do these legislators really listen to. The public opinion surveying seems to indicate support for moving forward and addressing the problem of those in the Medicaid gap, but the question is, legislative district by legislative district, what, do the le what are legislating, legislators hearing and what did they hear the Republicans the one in this one party state here during the primary? And we shouldn't forget that there are still the task force recommendations for schools, which require increasing investments in education every year, and pretty much the whole legislature and the exec executive branch have signed off on that, and that's, right. that's been a given, that's been a base for discussions. And so in some ways, that could edge out some of the other questions. Now before all of this happens, and before they even convene the, uh, assign the committees on June 17th, we have that GOP state convention where they write resolutions and planks, and how might that affect the conversation moving forward? Well, I, I think everybody who's, who's anticipating uh, this year's Idaho Republican Convention is just wondering if it could possibly be as wild and crazy and chaotic as last year's, and of course the answer is, no, nothing could be more <laughs> chaotic and unproductive and, and disastrous than what we saw last year, really a landmark for political dysfunction in Idaho. And as a result, everybody's watching, wondering what's it going to be like. I predict there will be a lot more attention paid to the convention this year just to see if it goes awry. What are you, as far as education goes, Kevin, what are you keeping an eye on for uh, the Idaho Republican State Convention? Well, I think you watch and you see uh, do, do you see any discussion, do you see any uh, platform planks on maybe what would be considered kind of fringe issues on, on education fronts? Do you see 
another run at the SBAC exam or another run at Common Core standards? Do you see any address, uh, any resolutions that address the Blaine Amendment uh, on you know, funding for uh, for religious education, which uh, critics see as just an end run around uh, the ban on, on school vouchers. Do you see any of those kind of issues come up? Do you see anybody bring up a, a Bible in schools resolution? Uh, knowing that Cheryl Knoxville, the leading sponsor of that bill, is no longer in the legislature. Do any of those issues come up? And it'll be interesting to see who is really in control uh, there will be a vote to reelect uh, the chair of the Republican Party. Will that happen? And the question will be what kind of resolutions, what kind of platform changes will be recommended by this group? And in this civil war or in this push and pull between the moderates and the more conservative members. Who, civil who war is sounds going, more fun. Who is, uh, civil war. Civil war. Who, who, who is going to prevail and what is this going to mean in terms of the future of the Republican Party? The civil war is nothing new and last week we said, or or the, the lovely pundits on Idaho Reports said that no one's really in control of the Idaho Republican Party right now. There's no one figurehead. Is this state convention going to change that? Oh, I doubt it, but it will sh tell us a lot about how divided some of the counties are. We've, we've watched as best we can because these aren't visible races for precinct committee uh, chairs or c precinct committee people and what that means in terms of the leadership of the individual counties. And from that, we'll see what kind of influence that has on the structure of the convention, the operation of the convention. I'd like to also throw one other thing into the mix, and that is we'll see how they select their delegates, these what, Cruz delegates? Cruz won the presidential primary in Idaho, and how that will play out. One other thing to keep in mind, there have been extreme and even outlandish resolutions and platform proposals in our, our in both parties' platforms, I think, historically and for many years. And just because the party platform says, we really support repealing the 17th Amendment and doing away with direct election of senators does not actually mean that that's what's going to be supported in Idaho. All right, that's all the time we have. Kevin, Betsy, and Jim, thank you for joining us. For our full interview with Secretary of State Denny, as well as an extended discussion with the pundits, visit idahoptv.org. And this is our last show of the season. We'll be back in the fall, but in the meantime, we'll see you online.